Last lecture we focused on the basic biological unit of the brain and other structures in your body, the neuron. We also looked at hormonal systems and how those two can interact to generate a lot of behaviors and the general structure of your body. Today we're going to talk about the brain one level up. So instead of just looking at the basic neurons, we're going to look at some of the different functional areas of the brain and how we might examine the brain. So the first thing that I want to say about the brain is that the brain is largely what makes you who you are. In fact, it's almost entirely who you are. The mind is what the brain does. It's what makes you, you. So the first most basic way that we can study the brain is through what's known as a lesion study, where we experimentally destroy portions of the brain to study the behaviors after the destruction. So we can't ethically do this in humans, right? I mean, that's just not going to happen. So oftentimes with lesion studies, we'll selectively damage portions of a rat brain. And then we'll examine how their behaviors change after the damage. But we can also do this with humans in a different way. With humans, what we do is we look at brain injuries and we examine what area of the brain has been damaged and we take medical and psychological reports as well as self-reports from the individual that was injured and family members and friends and we take that information put it all together in a big report and examine how behavior changed as a result of those injuries. Now once those injuries occur we use what's known as clinical observation, which is where we look at the different ways that the brain's working. We look at, uh, you know, the different ways that the person interacts with other individuals. And then we can catalog this information to give a basic idea of what area of the brain controls what personality characteristic or, you know, what... Uh, function like memory formation, things of that nature. So clinical observation is vital for human lesion style studies from the result of a brain injury. Or sometimes there's even been uh, lesion studies where we actually do perform surgery, but often as a necessary surgery to solve another issue. So we're never going to conduct brain surgery just for shits and giggles to see what happens. It's always for some sort of functional reason like say there's a massive hemorrhage in one area of the brain that's going to kill off a lot of cells and it needs to be removed. Then we can do clinical observation and learn a little bit more about what's happened. So let me give an example of using these clinical observations in combination with a known lesion. If any of you have ever heard of Phineas Gage, he is a perfect example of one of the ways that we can use these lesion studies. So he was hit, he worked on a railroad, and he was hit through the skull by a device known as a tamping rod. So this was way back when we were actually still actively building a lot of railroads. And so what happened was there was a minor explosion that shot a rod that was almost four or five feet long. I think it was four feet seven inches, somewhere around that, that area. Massive railroad spike, basically. But it's called a tamping rod, and it was part of what they used to develop it. Um, now, the, the interesting thing about Phineas Gage is that this happened and he was able to speak intelligently afterwards. We're going to find that part of the reason why was because the speech centers of his brain weren't actually damaged. So he got up and, uh, you know, he was speaking with people, telling the doctors what had happened to him, all while having a massive railroad spike sticking out of his brain. In fact, there was one moment where he threw up, understandably, and a portion of his freaking brain fell out. This man survived. He lived just fine. But we noticed some distinct behavioral differences between who he was before the accident and who he was after the accident. So before the accident, he was very friendly. He was well-loved amongst his peers. Uh, he had a good sense of humor. Afterwards, he became crude using profanity in situations where he would never use them before. He became impatient with his coworkers and easily frustrated. 
Uh, new evidence has emerged that have shown that, that this may have diminished over time and he may have gone back to more of the person that he was, but we were able to glean a lot from his personality changes and the location of his brain that was injured in the accident. So uh, the areas that were injured were the primarily the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe, as we're going to learn a little later on, is part of what makes humans so distinctly human. It's what allows us for higher level thinking and uh, it's basically a free range, free association area that has no, um, not the same level of specificity as some of the lower levels of your brain. So portions of his brain that were associated with being friendly, congenial, and humorous were damaged. But part of the reason why he might have been able to recoup some of this is something we're going to talk about in just a few minutes called neural plasticity, which basically says that the brain can compensate for damages and injuries over time. And as a result of this compensation ability, you can actually do a lot uh, with missing function. So for example, let's say uh, that you have an infant that through the result of a bio or a, rather the result of an accident uh, that damages their eyes, they're no longer able to see. So there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with the brain, the vision portion, it's all in the eyes. Well in that case, that part of the brain's not going to sit there and waste away. It's going to reallocate those neurons and enable you to do other things with it. Um, I, I hope you can't hear that loud noise. Uh, my cat has just decided to be very excited, so he's running around. But if you did, that's what that was. Um, so basically, the idea here is that the brain can change its functions based in large part on what's needed uh, and, and what's not being used. In addition, he might have had some experiences through socialization and learning that have retaught him how to properly function in society. But nonetheless, he wound up coming out of the accident being able to function in ways that would have never been expected given the extent of his injury. But we don't do this as much anymore. I mean, we certainly do have lesion studies with individuals that get injured, but we don't have to wait around for a brain injury anymore to study the brain. We have a lot of really exciting technologies that enable us to do much of what we used to do by a simple physical observation. So one of the things that we do is we can stimulate areas of the brain with chemicals or electrical impulses or we can observe changes that are happening naturally um, without directly stimulating the brain. So one of the things that we do is what's known as an EEG which gives a, an amp amplified recording of neural activity. Um, but it's, I mean, as you can see here, I mean, this is hard. I, I can't interpret this. You have to be a doctor to be able to interpret this. So the thing about EEGs is that they give us a really muddy picture of what's going on in the brain. So we don't use it as much for uh, research studies as we do for diagnostic criteria. So an EEG can be used to uh, diagnose things like epilepsy or sleep disorders, where we can examine neural activity that is abnormal. But it doesn't pinpoint structure and function of the brain. So how do we do that? Well, we do it in a couple of different ways. One of the things that we can do is what's known as a PET scan. So a PET or a PET scan gives us a visual display of the brain activity. So what they do is doctors give you this radioactive drink, essentially. It's a liquid glucose drink filled with a radioactive isotope of the chemicals within glucose. So what this enables us to do is you sit down and then you stretch out and then they put your brain towards this machine right here so that you are in the machine but you notice this isn't an MRI it's not a full body this is just looking at your brain and then what they do is they have you do a certain task now obviously you're, you're laying there you can't do really active tasks but instead you can do things like think about X or 
uh, you know, simple things like squeeze my hand. And what we can then do is we can observe where the glucose is being utilized by the brain to get a better understanding of the regions of the brain that are associated with certain activities. So um, it gives us some really interesting images and some really interesting examinations of what's being utilized. Now the reason why we use glucose is because glucose is the primary fuel source for all those neurons. Uh, if you watched that sodium potassium pump video uh, that I sent out earlier, uh, it, it mentioned ATP. So it's using glucose to help sort of pull apart and become ATP and then that's used by the brain. Uh, so glucose is vital for brain function. Another type of scan, which has a similar looking machine, but it's much longer because it enables your full body, is an MRI scan. So I've got images from two different studies that use two different types of MRI. So MRIs give us a really good examination. Uh, it gives us the most detailed pictures of the brain, and it gives us an examination of the structures of the brain. So in this top image right here, you can see that um, one of the portions of the brain we have are known as ventricles, which allow for fluids to flow throughout your brain. It, it's, uh, it's cushioning, it's, it's nutrients, there's, you know, the, the ventricles are important. And what we see is that in patients who are suffering from schizophrenia, their ventricles, which are right here, are enlarged compared to non-schizophrenia patients. But we also have a different type of MRI known as a functional MRI. So with a functional MRI what they do is they take a rapid fire series of pictures of the brain and they have you do an activity while you are having these images taken. So the classic study down here on the bottom is where they were asking individuals to lie about the cards that they have in their hand. And what they noticed is that lying activates based on changes in the structure of those areas of the brain based on blood flow. They've noticed that the left prefrontal cortex and the, angular, or the anterior cingulate cortex have a huge association with the action of lying. So this is one of the ways that we can sort of parse out what's happening in the brain when you're going through various activities. So now that we know how we study the brain, <clears throat> and of course the earliest form of studying the brain was taking a dead person and cutting them up, uh, now that we know a little bit more about the ways that we study brains now, let's look at what would happen if you did take a brain and cut it up. Let's look at the various structures that comprise our brains and how they've evolved over time. So the oldest brain structure is what's known as the brain stem. <clears throat> you essentially have to have a brain stem to survive. So uh, what you'll see with fish is that they'll have essentially a, an elongated brain that runs across uh, the, 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 their backs. Uh, and, and this is essentially what the brain stem is. It's, it's a long structure uh, that contains all of your essential functions. It's, it's the most primitive part of your brain and as makes perfect sense it exists in the most interior portion of your brain. So your brain stem goes down and hits your spinal cord and up here is where it swells. And that's where it becomes part of the brain and part of the brain's functional structures. So let's break the brain stem down into its primary components and it has four primary components. So the medulla which is right down here at the bottom, controls your heart rate. It also controls your breathing. So you need a medulla to survive. It's going to enable you to breathe and pump blood through your body. Just above that, right here, is what's known as the pons. And it coordinates your movement. So it's also essential because if you can't move, 
think about being out in the wild, if you can't move, you're prey. You're going to die if you cannot move. So again, it has a strong evolutionary need to exist, and as such, it is part of that earliest form of the brain, the brainstem. Running throughout the brainstem is a series of nerve fibers. This is known as the reticular formation. And so what the reticular formation does is it filters out sensory input. And it determines what goes on to the brain and what gets ignored. Uh, so it's an important component of the brain. One of the things that we're going to learn about later on is uh, desensitization. And uh, of sensory input, not of, of things like violence. We're talking about sensory input. So one of the things, and of course this doesn't work if you're actively thinking about it, but let's say that someone is tapping you on the arm. Well, over time, the neural impulse that gets sent from that area of the body is going to dull. It's going to relax and say, you know what, I already know that I'm getting tapped right there. I don't need to continue sending that sensory input. So that's extraneous information that the brain no longer needs, and as such, the reticular formation, in concert with the thalamus, which we're about to talk about, will filter out that sensory input and ignore it. So over time, you will be less aware of the fact that you are being continuously tapped by some jerk that is tapping you for absolutely no reason. At the very top of the brainstem is where we have the thalamus. So the thalamus takes all the information that the reticular formation has sent up to it and sends it out. It's essentially like a hub. It's, it's an international airport. It takes all these planes of information in and then it sends them out to where they belong. So basically its primary function is to say, okay, that's a sensation of touch. You go over here. That's a sensation of sound. You go over here. That's an emotion. You go there. So that's what the thalamus does. It's the switchboard, and it's a very important part of the primitive brain. Now, behind the brainstem, we have another interesting formation called the cerebellum. So this was the next thing to evolve. And it sits, once again, right on the spinal cord. So it's behind the brainstem and on the spinal cord. And it's really important for coordinating your voluntary movement. So, uh, you know, my cat has a cerebellum. And so as a result of his cerebellum, he's not moving only on impulse. Sometimes he wants attention, and so he will walk over to me and rub his body on my leg, and that's voluntary movement. It's not vital for survival, but it's pretty darn helpful because, giving my cat as an example again, if he wants food and he can't go out and hunt for himself because he's a fat indoor cat, he's going to come up to me, rub his leg or rub his body on my leg, look up at me and meow and that signals to me, oh maybe I should give fatty some food. As a result, he's better able to survive. So it's it's not required for survival, but it really boosts survival ability. It also has some other functions like nonverbal learning. Uh, it, it aids in some memory, uh, emotions, understanding of time. So, uh, you know, cats even have a rudimentary understanding of time. Uh, there's also functions for sound, touch, voluntary movement. So it's, it's essentially like a little tiny focused brain. It does a lot of the actions that the rest of your brain does, um, but it also does it in a smaller format and it assists a lot of the other functions in the upper areas of your brain. So all of these effort, all of these, uh, all of these things—the brainstem and the cerebellum—happen without any cognitive input. These are things that happen effortlessly and automatically. You don't have to think about breathing; it happens. You don't have to think about, you know, a lot of different aspects. You know, if if something dangerous happens and you start running, <clears throat> like let's say there's an explosion behind you and you start running. You're not thinking about it. These portions of your brain are enabling you to do it effortlessly. 
So most species have a brain stem, and a lot of them, probably most of them, also have a cerebellum. Now the next layer up is the limbic system. So the limbic system is, once again, not unique to humans. The limbic system exists in a lot of species because essentially what it does is it coordinates a lot of vital functions like memory formation, fight or flight reactions, the drive for sex, uh, I mean the, the list goes on. The, the limbic system is very important. So let me just recap. So we've got right here, this is the brain stem. Behind it is the cerebellum. And then above all of that is the limbic system. So let's go into the various parts of the limbic system. I'm going to talk about three parts. I'm going to talk about the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. So let's start with the amygdala. The amygdala is essentially the fight or flight response area. So this is where, if you take anxiolytics, which are anti-anxiety medicine, this is where it operates. It operates on that fear component. Uh, so it's one of the most primal, basic, can't control it, emotional centers of the brain. You can't control that experience of fear. You can control how you react to the fear, absolutely. But this is very much something that's not uh, controllable. One of the other things that it does is it aids in the processing of emotional memories. So, you know, later on we're going to learn about repressed memories and how there's a lot of contention surrounding the idea of suppressed memories. Part of the reason why is because your body doesn't want to suppress memories that aid survival. So learning, hey, that asshole is dangerous. I need to stay the fuck away from him. That is an emotional memory linked to an emotional event. And so what we see is that the amygdala, in concert with the next area I'm going to talk about, which is the, um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, it works with the hippocampus, um, and it also works with the uh, hypothalamus. So these things work together to create emotional memories, and as a result of that, uh, we have less reason to believe, particularly with single incidences, that repressed memories just don't happen. When we get to that, when we get to the stress lecture, we'll learn a little bit more about how repressed memories may occur in sustained abuse, but single instances of abuse almost never result in repressed memories. So the Hippocampus, um, which is the next part that I want to talk about, and I'm just going to work off of this picture because I don't have a separate slide for it, is the memories and spatial navigation. So it's this long tube right here. And it sits right off of the amygdala, which, as you recall, is right there. So I mentioned earlier that anxiolytics operate on the amygdala. So what they do is they work on the amygdala and, and reduce the sensation of fear. But because it's so tightly linked with this hippocampus, what we see is that oftentimes the hippocampus suffers effects of the medication which operates on the amygdala. So a lot of people love abusing benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are a type of medication that operates on the amygdala. Uh, so uh, medications like Xanax and uh, cl clonazepam, which is known as clonopin, um, these are two perfect examples of medication. Now, if you know anybody that's abused these drugs, and I highly recommend that you never abuse these drugs, and you're going to find out why in a minute, they actually inhibit the ability to walk properly, because remember, uh, balance is often processed right here, spatial navigation, all of this is in the hippocampus. There's some of it in the brain stem as well, but spatial navigation is impacted by this. In addition, memory formation is impacted by this, which means that you are less able to form new memories while under the impact of an anxiolytic. So again, if you know anybody that has abused these drugs, and then you speak with them and you ask them how their night went, a lot of times they're going to say, I have no idea, man, but it was great. 
They might remember that they had a good time because they had that reduced sensation of fear and anger. But on the other side of the coin, they remember that they were positive, but they don't remember why because they were unable to form those new memories. So the last part of the limbic system is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus controls things like hunger, thirst, body temperature, sexual motivation, emotional control, but more importantly, one of the things that ties back to what we learned last lecture is that it actually controls the pituitary gland. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it controls the master gland of the endocrine system. So if you remember from last lecture, the pituitary gland controls the release of the hormones of all of the different components of the endocrine system. But the pituitary gland is controlled by the hypothalamus. So there's a constant connection between the neural circuitry of your brain and the hormonal system. So remember the fast communication of the neurons and the slow communication of the hormones, they work in concert here. And so this part of the brain controls that part of the brain which controls all of the glands in the body. But this is all rudimentary lower level stuff when it comes to the function of your brain. This is again primarily automated. These are things that control without there that occur without much thinking. You know, you don't have to think to get hungry. You just get hungry. Your hypothalamus is why that happens. So what's above all that? What's this stuff up here that we call our gray matter? Well, this is what makes us us. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. This is known as the cerebral cortex. So it controls and processes all the information that comes through your brain. So uh, you might experience fear in your amygdala. But the thought process up here that says, what does that fear mean? That all happens in the cerebral cortex. So, uh, you know, if, if you have an emotion, well, I'm going to take children as an example. All right, so let's say that you walk up to a very young child, a child that's like two or three, and they say that they don't feel well. Oftentimes, they can't tell you what that don't feel well means. They can just say, I, something doesn't feel right. And that's because the cerebral cortex is still developing and understanding what all of these different stimuli mean. So it's a learning process over time that tells your body what it means. So now, now that you're older, you're better able to say, oh man, I think I'm coming down with a cold. And that's because of your cerebral cortex that enables you to piece together all the information and process it in a prediction style fashion that gives you a good idea of what's going on. But the cerebral cortex isn't just one big lump. It's actually separated into different functional areas. So we've got the frontal lobe up here. And the frontal lobe is what was damaged in Phineas Gage and is part of our upper level thinking. And what we see is that uh, humans have larger frontal lobes in comparison with many other species. And we also see that species like dolphins have larger frontal lobes as well. Species that we know are capable of higher level thinking tend to have larger frontal lobes. And then we've also got the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, and we're going to learn more about those later. And then the occipital lobe. Uh, I do want to just tell you a fun little thing about the occipital lobe that uh, I don't want you to try, but it's something that uh, you might remember from an event in your past. The occipital lobe is actually the visual cortex. So um, its primary function is processing visual input. So if you have ever fallen on the back of your head and seen fuzzy stars, that's what's happening. You're actually stimulating the neurons in the occipital lobe by smashing it. And as a result, it's reading that as visual input, even when there's no actual visual input. So if someone smacks you upside the head hard enough, you're going to see stars because your occipital lobe is interpreting that as visual information coming from your eyes, even when there's not visual information coming from your eyes.
Don't try it at home, but interesting nonetheless. So all of this gray matter is supported by glial cells. And we talked about glial cells last lecture. They're what sustain the neurons. So if the neuron was a queen bee, the glial cells are the worker bees. So they have a lot of important functions. So um, one of the uh, next parts that I'm going to discuss here is uh, the, the functional areas of the cortex. So if you look right here where this pink and blue line is, this is roughly at the fissure of the parietal and the frontal lobes. And this is where the motor and sensory cortex exists. So these two strips of your brain, and we see this cross species, these two strips of the brain exist in pretty much all species, in fact, all species. Um, and, and what they do is they control various aspects. So the pink right here is the motor cortex, and that controls what you do with the parts of your body that you can control. So it's what allows you to wiggle your toes or crack your ankle or swallow your food. Um, and then back behind that is the input, and that's the sensory cortex. So this is what enables you to do things like feel with your fingers, uh, taste with your tongue. So it funnels the input in, and then the output decides what you do with that information. So uh, let's use the example of the mouth. So you put something in your mouth, using the motor cortex and then you taste with your tongue using the sensory cortex that is really really bitter so that information gets fed over to the motor cortex and then you you make the decision to spit it out so that's sort of an example of the interplay between these two cortices Now, one of the things that's most important to know about the brain is that nothing happens in a vacuum. One part of your brain is almost always communicating in some fashion with another part of the brain. So we'll see two core areas light up in both visual and auditory functions. So if uh, you were looking at a face, primarily your visual cortex would light up. But there's also that part of your brain that recognizes the face and says it in your mind. Oh, that's my friend so-and-so. So the auditory and the visual cortex light up. <clears throat> the same is true with people who hallucinate. We'll see that when people are having hallucinations, both the auditory and the visual cortex will light up. So what about, you know, the core areas of the brain and their primary functions? Well, as I mentioned before, they are largely cross species. So we see that rats have the same motor areas in roughly the same location, that is, between sensory areas, as most other species. But what you'll see is as we get more evolved, um, and I say that not meaning that the other species aren't evolving as well, but higher order evolution, we see that we have more of this pink to go around. So this pink right there is what's known as an association area. And these association areas are less committed to a single function. It's open space, basically, is what I'm saying. And this open space is, again, part of what makes us so human. So what you'll notice is that the frontal lobe is pretty much open. It is open for higher level thinking. It's open for personality development. And the same is true in the chimpanzee. You'll see that it's smaller, but nonetheless, they have an impressive frontal lobe, whereas Kitty, over here, doesn't. He has some association area, which is why there are different personalities in cats but it's not as broad as the personality differences that you might observe in a chimpanzee. So I'm going to give an example of some of the functional areas of the brain that we have located and ask you to read this sentence aloud. Aphasia is an impairment of language 
usually caused by left hemisphere damage either to Broca's area, impaired speaking, or to Wernicke's area, impaired understanding. So when you read that statement aloud, or if you didn't, when I read it aloud, this is what was happening in our respective brains. The first area to activate is down here, and that's the visual cortex. So remember that occipital lobe is being activated right there. The information gets funneled to the angular gyrus. So what happens is Wernicke's area cannot interpret visual information. So the angular gyrus transforms that into a method which Wernicke's area can interpret. So it takes that auditory code and bam, it pushes it over to Broca's area, which controls the speech muscles using this motor cortex, which is right here. So for each and every word that I read, it went one, two, three, four, five, until I actually stated it. So this is what I'm talking about when I said earlier that nothing happens in a vacuum. One part of your brain is almost always in connection with another part of the brain. And it does this through electrical, chemical, and magnetic impulses that go throughout your brain at all times. So it's really impressive to think that for me to be able to read a sentence, five things are going on in my brain at one time. And they're doing it at such a fast pace that it's not even noticeable to humans that this is going on. So what we can see is that there are certain levels of specialization but again this area of the brain is working heavily with this area of the brain to work with speech and communication so there's definitely specialization but there's heavy integration between areas now I mentioned earlier that uh, you know Phineas Gage was able to live a relatively normal life for some years uh, after he had finally started to recover some of who he was. Part of that is absolutely the result of socialization and learning. So he's using those other areas of his frontal lobe that still exist and the other association areas in his brain that haven't been used. He's using them to learn a little bit about social cues. And this is also part of what's known as brain plasticity. So plasticity is the brain's ability to change uh, the commitment of a certain area based on injury or illness. So if you have brain damage of some sort, your brain then becomes uh, plastic in a certain way. It's always plastic, but it uses this plasticity to change uh, you know, what that area of the brain might do. So I mentioned earlier uh, the blind child that was not brain damaged, but was instead damaged in the eye. Well, that's a perfect example of neuroplasticity. It can no longer use the occipital lobe for that visual information, so instead it reallocates it for other things. In addition to our brains being able to overcome quite a lot uh, when, when it comes to damage, we're going to learn a little bit more about some other really, really surprising ways that it can overcome damage. So our brain is not only split into four lobes, it's also split right down the middle. So if you have a centered part and you run your fingers along the part, you're also running your fingers essentially along the line that divides your brain into two hemispheres. Now, the left hemisphere tends to be more dominant than the right in almost everybody because of its functions, which are processing reading, writing, speaking, math, comprehension, etc. So the left brain is pretty damn dominant. But what I'm talking about here is not what uh, people love to refer to as being right-brained or left-brained. There's not... There's no one person, aside from people that we're going to talk about in a minute, that use one side of the brain and not the other. Uh, the idea might be that you use one more than the other based on the activities that you engage in and the activities that you enjoy, but the left hemisphere is huge. 
not in size, but in use. So what connects these two hemispheres? Well, it's this really interesting structure known as the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is this nerve fibers that connect one side of the brain to the other. <coughs> and um, what we see is, uh, and, and this is this is something that's controversial, it's gone back and forth, but there have been studies that have shown that men have weaker corpus callosums than women, and that that might be part of the explanation for why women are better able to uh, relay information faster when it comes to emotional speech. But there are other studies that have found the, not the opposite, but have found no support for that. So we still don't understand necessarily uh, why there are different fiber sizes or whether or not there actually are. Um, but we do know that the corpus callosum is what joins together these two hemispheres of the brain. What happens though if you cut the brain? So let's say that you take the corpus callosum and you cut it. You get rid of all those connections. Can you still survive? Absolutely. So there are for need, there are certain needs to split the brain. These people survive just fine. And in fact, it's actually a really interesting way to examine one of the most unique and interesting features of the brain, which is that information taken in from the left side of the body is generally processed by the right side of the brain, and opposite of that as well. So one of the things that they have done in the past is taken patients that have, out of medical necessity, had their corpus callosum split. And then they present them information which has something different in the left visual field from what's in the right visual field. And what they'll see is that information from the right visual field will be processed in the left visual area of the brain. Same is true with the left visual field going to the right hemisphere of the brain. So what are some of the outcomes of these tests? Well, this is a perfect example. So we have this woman right here who has a split corpus callosum. And they show her the word heart. But they tell her, look at the red dot in the middle of the word. So the word is presented very quickly. And what we can see is if you ask her, what word did you see? She will say, art. But if you ask her to point with her left hand what word she saw, she would press H-E for he. So this is because the information from the right visual field is being processed by the left visual area. So that's what enables speech. The left field is being processed by the right area. So this is one of the ways that we can examine people with the split brain. And I really feel for these people. I know that it's medically necessary, but oftentimes they'll have very frustrating experiences because the brains often act independently of one another. So, uh, you know, there, there have been people with split brain that get really frustrated because they'll start putting away their groceries and one hand will put the grocery up in the cabinet and the other hand will take it back down. Uh, they'll find uh, them unbuttoning their shirt with their left hand. Their left hand tends to be the most problematic. Unbuttoning their shirt with their left hand even though they, they didn't want to do that. Uh, so having a split brain is certainly not ideal, but they can still function for the most part uh, in a way that you wouldn't ever notice uh, that they were <clears throat> damaged in that way. In fact, uh, you know, a perfect way to test this out is, uh, is people with the split brain are able to draw two distinct images simultaneously. So it doesn't matter if, you know, you, you have crappy left-handed drawing. If I were to give you two pencils and ask you to draw two shapes, it would be, if not impossible, near impossible to draw two different shapes. Now you might be able to draw two squares by forcing your hands to do the same thing. Uh, but this is, you know, this is part of why it's so difficult to uh, rub your belly and pat your head. It's possible, um, but it's in large part because of the, the need for the communication between those two sides of the brain.
and that individuals without that connection are able to do these tasks much easier because they have the left brain controlling the right hand and the right brain controlling the left hand. So one of the things, uh, let me go back a little bit, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, has been a really good examination of the neuroplasticity and how the brain can overcome great obstacles is that some people due in large part to epilepsy, that's the primary reason for this, some people need an entire hemisphere of their brain removed. And yet, once they're done with the surgery, <clears throat> they are still largely who they were before. This is because of the plasticity of the brain. It's able to compensate for damage, and that's a huge damage, I mean that's a loss of half of your brain. They're able to compensate for that in a way that enables them to be, if not exactly who they were before, pretty darn similar to who they were prior to having a portion of their brain removed. Alright, so the last slide. Most of us don't have a split brain. You know what? We are... We have no need for a split brain. So what we have is two hemispheres connected by the corpus callosum. And what we see is that uh, the, there are differences in function. In other words, we can do tests that examine how uh, your brain processes information on the left side versus the right. Uh, and we see that uh, people engage their right brain uh, for a perceptual task, left brain for a linguistic task. Um, but as a whole, the brain communicates across the corpus callosum, it communicates within different areas and across different areas because it's it's not in a vacuum. Your brain communicates all over the place. So in closing, there's really no such thing as a left brain person or a right brain person. There might be more right dependent than normal, but generally speaking, the left brain will still always have more activity based on its functional uses. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit more about the structure and function of various parts of the brain. Uh, and, uh, you know, join us next time. We're going to have some questions posted up on Reddit ready for you to answer. Feel free to ask me any questions that you might have. And we look forward to seeing you next time.